Hi, my name is Gary Hergert. I'm a soil and nutrient manage management specialist at uh, Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. And today I'll be discussing soil characteristics that influence nitrogen and water management. One of the things when producers manage nitrogen and water, they worry about and the causes of soil variation. Well, if you go back to our beginning soils courses, the thing that causes soil variation are the five soil forming factors. Those are noted here in the slide. Those are the parent material, the climate, the native vegetation, topography, and time. Now, those factors lead to the creation of our soils and our soil series. The soil series is just the name of the different soils that we have in Nebraska. The soil series is determined by the parent material that you have, the different horizons, and in this slide you can see the layers you see the darker layer of organic matter accumulation. There's a little bit of transition right in here. And then we get into some lighter material and eventually we get into the parent material. But the soil series also has different colors, different textures, different thicknesses, can have different slopes, and can have different erosion phases. By the way, this is the state soil of Nebraska. This is the uh, Holdridge, a good, well-drained silt loam soil. All soil profiles exhibit the same characteristics. If we think very simply about the top, middle, and lower layers, we talk about the A, B, and C horizons in the soil. At the top, in a native state, we have a zone where we have accumulation of organic matter. When we were in, under native prairie, this is the, the decaying grasses. Uh, under crop systems, this is the crop residue that goes back into the soil. Uh, below that, there's a transition zone where we do a lot of tillage, whether that's plowing or disking, that top A horizon many times is what we call an a, a plowed layer or a tilled layer. Below that, many times we have a zone of accumulation of clay that formed during the process of soil formation. Below that, we have the weathered parent material and way down deeper in the soil, usually, uh, four to five feet, we have the original parent material that the soil is made of. So when we're in a given ecoregion of the state, the soil series can vary depending upon the slope and landscape position, even with the same parent material. That's because if you go through most of Nebraska, we're a fairly hilly state, other than the flat areas in the river valleys that you a lot of people think Nebraska is flat because they drive through the interstate, which covers two-thirds of the state. Uh, on sloping terrain, the hillsides are going to run off water. You're going to have water collection in the bottom. In the same parent material, that will create different soils. The other way that we get different soils in Nebraska is that many of areas, uh, especially in eastern Nebraska, we may have luss, which is a windblown silt material that's overlying some silt and clay, and below that we may have glacial till that was deposited here during a past glacial age. As that material has eroded in recent geologic time, you have different layers or different textures that are exposed, different parent materials. Those will lead to different soils, different soil series, and if they differ very greatly in their initial parent material, they can have very different infiltration characteristics. So when we get to an irrigation situation, uh, and we're doing furrow irrigation, this is an example of a cornfield uh, under uh, furrow irrigation with gated pipe. We have two soils that are developed from luss, a hall and a hoard. They're somewhat similar, However, the hall soil has a thicker B horizon than the hoard soil. The hall series, with that thicker B horizon, has smaller pores, it has more clay, it will actually take in water more slowly. So the result of this, if we were furrow irrigating and the hoard was at the upper end and the hall was at the lower end, the B horizon controls the infiltration, especially in the non-trafficked or what we call the soft rows. During a first irrigation, at the beginning of the season, our water intake is at its maximum. But because the hall has a slower intake, when we irrigate over a number of hours, the soil 
depth that is wetted in the hull is actually less than the hoard, which is at the bottom. Usually we see more intake at the upper end of the field, up in this area, and the lower end has less. But in this example, it's different, and that's influenced very much by the two different soils that we have. However, in the, the hard row, and the hard row is the one that is driven on when you do planting or tillage operations, fertilizing, spraying. In the hard row, during that first irrigation, the intake is significantly less. It's about two and a half times less than in the soft row. And again, that influences the intake between the hull and the hoard. A thing that I did mention, wheel traffic affects infiltration. As we continue to reduce tillage and go to more reduced till and no till, we do have less wheel traffic. But in a number of situations, if you think about all the operations that we do during a year to produce a crop, we have a number of different wheel patterns that we create depending upon the swath width of the equipment that we're using. Early in the season, we may have a large floater out there that is applying fertilizer or herbicide. Um, later on, we come through with a planter. Planter widths now range from six rows up to 24 rows. Uh, we come through later with a combine uh, that usually takes a swath width of six, eight, or even 12 rows. And so we look at where those traffic patterns are and that can create compaction in different places. Now most of our compaction really occurs during the fall, during harvest when soils are wet. Most of the time during springtime, we have uh, good enough flotation with most of our tractors and our implements that we aren't causing a lot of compaction in the springtime. All of that relates to how soils store water and how then plants use that available water in our soils. So what I'm going to describe is a very simple model of soil water holding capacity. And in th this example, what I'd like you to think about is we have a bucket. Okay, now if you fill the bucket too full at the top, the water basically runs over. So at the top of that bucket, there's really kind of a drain. Uh, that water, when you fill the bucket, all the way to the top, you will lose what we call that very temporary storage. In a soil, that maximum amount of water that it will hold is what we call soil saturation. After you irrigate and allow the soil to drain by gravity, in about three days you will reach a point that we call field capacity. That's the maximum water holding capacity of that soil. Now, Plants can use water in a range down to what we call the permanent wilting point. The permanent wilting point, usually we don't like to get a soil that dry before we add water back. We normally think of the trying to keep the water capacity in the soil somewhere between field capacity and at about 50% of in this available plant range. Plants can take this water down in this range, but it takes a lot more energy uh, and they puts them under some mild stress. Below permanent wilting point, there is still water in the soil. Uh, if we take a soil and we put it in an oven and we uh, heat it up to about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, we can drive water off. But that water that's in the soil in, in this range is held so tightly that the plant roots cannot extract it, and that's called unavailable water. So really, the water that is available to the plant is between field capacity and permanent wilting point, but for managing for irrigation, we're really thinking about between field capacity and about 50% of that readily available water. Different soils that are formed have different water holding capacities. Generally, our sandy soils have the least amount of water holding capacity. Our silt loams actually have some of the highest water holding capacity, and the clays have a little bit less than the silt loams. So this slide just shows you the range for some of the different soil textures. Very coarse soils 
like a coarse sand and gravel, will only hold three-tenths to six-tenths of an inch of plant available water in one foot. Typically, that would be about a half, half an inch that we see uh, on, uh, for this soil. A loamy sand will have about one. So as you can see, most, most of our sandy soils, if they are not extremely sandy, will have a, a little more than an inch of plant available water per foot. When we get to sandy loams, loams and silt loams, you can see our water capacity goes up significantly. Right here, a, a good loam or a silt loam will hold 1.8 to 2 inches per foot. Again, we have a wide range. Uh, there's not one value. Uh, much of the information on water holding capacity can be found in soil survey documents. A lot of this now is on uh, the USDA MRCS site on a program called Web Soil Survey. You can go there, zoom in and find your soil, and all of these characteristics are, will be listed for the soil series that you have on your farm. Now, as we think about the soil water holding capacity, the other thing that affects the plant's ability to take up water is really how it is growing and how is it extending roots down into that root zone. Early in the growing season, as we see over here, we have a small plant that's maybe two feet tall. We've got about a two foot effective root zone. Even though we've got moisture down below, that plant cannot use that because we don't have roots down there yet. As the plant continues to grow, we will extend down and get that effective root zone. Uh, in most of our soils, we're going to take most of our water from the top three to four feet, although in many of our deep soils that don't have any restrictions, we can have rooting to five feet. So the effective root zone is another factor that you need to consider when you're thinking about nitrogen and irrigation management. Because if you overfill the root zone in, the, in this, you'll possibly move some nitrogen deeper that the plant can't get to until the roots get there when the plant grows. When we think about infiltration of water into soil, uh, different soil textures take in water differently. Uh, there is a lot of variability over both space and time and uh, that is really the only constant. But generally, our sandy soils have very high infiltration rates. Well-structured loams have good infiltration. Silt loam soils with good structure have good infiltration. If we don't have as good of soil structure and soil quality, our infiltration decreases. The other thing, if we're irrigating, initially, under furrow irrigation, the water infiltration rate is very high. In this example, you can see the initial rate for this soil is about one and a half inches per hour. However, the longer we run water in that soil, the infiltration rate continues to decrease, and after about four hours, we reach a much lower rate that stays pretty constant. So for a 12-hour irrigation set, uh, as shown in this example here, we uh, see that that basic rate is reached after about three or four hours. The thing that we find is that initially we're taking in a lot of water. So in a 12-hour irrigation set, in this example, uh, this soil actually took in about 4.6 inches of water. And this is the first irrigation on a soft row in a well-structured silt loam soil. The other thing that we notice with irrigation during the growing season, whether it's under furrow irrigation or even under center pivots, is we usually see a decrease across the growing season in the infiltration rate. This occurs most of the time, but not always. It's something that you as a producer must be aware of. Um, you're going to put on a given amount of water. Um, later in the season, you may see that you're starting to get some ponding or a little bit of runoff. That means that your infiltration rate has actually decreased, and you'll need to adjust your application rate accordingly. So what we've depicted in this slide is just showing the difference between the irrigation infiltration from that first irrigation to a later irrigation. And it's really that initial intake in those first couple of hours 
where you really have a significant difference later in the season in, uh, in this example. I mentioned earlier that we do have significant differences in infiltration. Generally, our sandy soils have much higher infiltration rates. The silt loams are in the middle, and a silty clay would have a much lower initial infiltration beginning at the beginning of the season. And these would decrease somewhat throughout the growing season also. Another factor that influences water movement, water holding capacity, and the plant's availability to take up both water and nitrogen is soil compaction. Now this is an extreme example. Uh, sometimes uh, you get a combine stuck, you definitely are going to have some compaction there. But we create compaction by running implements over the soil, like a disc, when we, if we disc a soil it's too wet, by running equipment on it um, when the soil is too wet. We essentially squash down the soil aggregates and make them more dense. Uh, we have more solids in a given space and less pore space. That decrease in what we call bulk density is an increase in compaction. And it creates those smaller pores and what we call dead-end pores. Now, when we started farming the sand hills uh, and people were able to go in and work sandy soils, they thought, whoa, the sand is dry, I can go work it. We saw a number of examples of compaction caused by double disking in the spring on sandy soils. And down about the depth of the disk, and in this example, we see a compaction zone here that's down fairly deep. And this probably is from a plow pan. But what you see here on the corn roots is you have very thick, kind of stubby corn roots. That's an indication of, of a compacted layer down here. And if you look in this pit, we really don't have any corn roots down here. We've got a very significant compaction layer down here. All of the corn roots are up in this area. Well, you're trying to grow a corn crop on less than one foot of soil. And um, no matter how much you irrigate, you really can't keep up with that. Now what happens is this limits the amount of nitrogen and the water that that crop has access to. So compaction limits access to both water and nitrogen. The thing is when we have a zone of compaction, the water and the nitrogen actually move through that. But the layer is so dense that the corn roots cannot penetrate through that, and so you essentially just have a very limited root zone. The water and nitrogen move through slowly. If you continue to over-irrigate, you'll continue moving that water and nitrogen down, and ultimately that nitrogen will reach the groundwater table and uh, increase the nitrogen level of the groundwater. Water and nitrogen that move below that area are not available to the crop because of this zone of compaction. Uh, if you didn't have, if you can break up that zone of compaction somehow and you can get rooting down through that, then the crop would be able to get to that. Um, many people early on, when we didn't realize we were creating these problems, uh, would go in with ripping in the middle of the season. That helped to some extent. Um, but really we have to take care of that problem before we plant the crop. And the main thing that we need to do is make sure that we don't recreate the zone of compaction once we've broken it up. So with that, uh, soil characteristics from soil formation, the parent materials, the acting over time, the weathering forces create the variability slopes, different parent materials, create different soils that create different water holding capacities. The production practices that we do where we cause soil compaction can decrease the plant's ability to get both nitrogen and water and affect our nitrogen uh, uptake efficiency and our irrigation efficiency. Thank you.